Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Tennis Talk. Today we are joined by a man with, a, with a, quite a few accolades, a former professional tennis player, founder of a, a cool company called High Caliber Collective, and the holder of the world record for the longest doubles match ever, uh, James Klusky. Welcome to the show, James. Thanks. And I think when I told you about that world record we were going to do, I think you said you'll never do it. Uh, I don't know if I'd be fit enough. Um, it, 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 I presume I'm right, it hasn't been beaten or challenged in the meantime, has it? I don't think so, no. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. Yeah. Um, and that was David Mullins, Luke Maguire, Dan O'Neill, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, those three lads. So, yeah, it was good. I'm, I'm glad we did it. I don't know if I'd be, I don't know if I'd be racing to do it again, to yeah. be honest, but uh, it was good fun. Yeah, and it must, it must have been mental torture in the last few hours. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a funny one. Like I've never I've never ran a marathon or or, or anything like that. But I, I thought um, the hardest part was like the Sunday morning early when it was dark. Basically, I think it was like three a.m. to six a.m. or seven a.m. But actually, once we got through, once we this is my own personal opinion. But once we got through that, um, once the sun came up on the Sunday, I actually didn't find the last couple of hours as as hard as I thought it would, you know, it was like, mm. you know, more people were there watching and stuff as well. So, um, how, how many, how many hours was it again? It was 60 hours and 20 minutes or something. There's 60 wow. hours and I can't even remember how many minutes it was, but 60 hours. Yeah. When I, when I hit my mates down, then my local club, when an hour is up, I'm, I'm happy. I'm tired. Ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, so tell me a little bit your your most we'll maybe go back to tennis later but um i assume your main your main gig now is high caliber collective you might tell us a little bit about what you what that company does yeah so i um i suppose and obviously we'll talk about my playing days but i was always interested in people development and uh i suppose performance and high performance and um, it was always an area that really interested me and when I stopped playing professionally uh, I worked a couple of months in, in uh, McNulty performance with the, and the McNulty who's the sports psychologist for the Irish rugby team and does a lot of corporate stuff and that kind of stoked my interest in the space as well um, and really one thing led to another I started I suppose about a year and a half ago I started hosting my own events which was related to something else but I I I had this idea that I wanted to bring business people together to talk about topics, whether it was leadership or whether it was work-life balance or um, different topics like that. And I kind of, you know, leveraged the people that I've met, the business people I've met through tennis and, and um, a guy called Dan Kiley, who, who owned a company called Vox Pro. He was very kind to come to the first one, which is around leadership. Um, and then I brought these CEOs together. And the event went well. I kind of facilitated the discussion uh, around the topic. And, and then from that, what it led to was a lot of the CEOs asking me their, into their company uh, to do different different things. So um, uh, in the background, I was doing one-to-one or I was doing executive coaching qualifications. And uh, yeah, so I ended up in, in their companies. And I suppose what I'm doing is really three things is... One is I do a lot of one-to-one coaching, um, so with people around performance, people setting goals, achieving their goals in, in, in corporate life. Um, I do a lot of team development programs, usually for tech companies, um, companies looking to, you know, a, a commercial team is looking to hit a target, work with the team around that and do offsites for the company. Um, and then the third thing I do is I do a lot of speaking. So I go into organizations and give, give talks. Uh, usually it's an hour talk on, on the topic of high performance and goal setting and um, kind of the lessons that I've learned throughout my, my career. So I do a lot of those talks for, for the VHI, um, which, which, is, which is great. And obviously, uh, obviously that's stopped at the moment just with what's going on. But um, yeah, so things have, been, things have been very good. I've been, I've been busy and uh, I have another couple of people that are working with me as well that I can, you know, if an organization is looking for a nutritionist or, or something like that, that I can plug okay. them in as well. So I suppose that's a snapshot of it. Yeah, and, and I was thinking earlier that now might be a time where your skills might be needed, but in a, in a slightly different way. You know, I say... I think I saw you. You maybe work with Airbnb a little bit, and I know. My, yeah. I know myself. I do Airbnb. It's all stopped. So I imagine. I'm not sure if Airbnb employees are still employed or or. But 
I imagine it's a tough time for a lot of people who overnight they just they can't go in and do their their job that they they maybe love every day and but companies obviously want them to stay stay well mentally and, and physically so yeah i mean it's yeah it's a good point i mean i, I still do work with 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 their bnb so um yeah it's like a one-to-one stuff with people obviously it's 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 remote uh the stuff i'm doing at the moment um so yeah so the one-to-one coaching stuff is important to kind of give give a person someone to talk to really mm. um i know that when i you know when i retired from tennis i i went to an executive coach a guy called Stephen tadell in malahide who's tennis he's a he's a league tennis player from malahide um he does a lot of he's a lot of experience and a lot of uh, one-to-one coaching and he helped me in incredible amount so um i really believe in the power of kind of speaking to someone even outside your industry or someone that can just you can kind of shoot the breeze with a little bit and, and they can challenge you as well yeah it's funny because when i closed my tennis shop the first thing that came to my mind is i actually might do a podcast where i get friends and tennis people on almost just to, to like you say shoot the breeze with them and <laughs> for me for me it's great it's it's nearly like you know counseling from my kitchen <laughs> Exactly, yes, therapeutic. Um, and I also thought today, obviously everyone's going through a pretty rough time and we're, we're drawing on every bit of courage and fortitude we have, but I know your your brother Stephen um, went through something uh, extremely difficult and I, I came across a clip of Richard Branson speaking about your brother this morning and he kind of testament to his pay or pay tribute to his attitude towards what happened to him and how he he developed his life after him I'm, I might be putting you on the spot but um would you mind relaying what happened to your brother yeah no, no that's a, that's okay um I'm still waiting for my commission payment from that Richard Branson comment <laughs> we'll, 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 ta- we'll talk about Richie later <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I suppose like it's obviously we, we um, it's a pretty traumatic time in, in our lives, but I think it, it uh, it's an experience that really I suppose sh- shapes you in a lot of ways and and kind of develops your values and your philosophy on life and, and those types of things. And uh, when I was fifteen, Stephen was Stephen was seventeen. I, I wasn't there at the time, but he he had a spinal injury accident. Uh, on a farm, uh, he fell off a hay bale um, and was paralyzed from the neck down. So, you know, like an incredibly, incredibly difficult time. Um, and from there then, like, you know, he's obviously an inspiration to me and what, what he's done and in terms of like his activism and he's he's been on the late late show he's done tv shows and um helping people you know wheelchair accessible transport fighting for people's rights who are in wheelchairs started a company called mobility mojo a couple of years ago which is which is doing really well and and uh it's all around people traveling actually and and being able to find uh, accessible rooms and in, in, in hotels and he's done a ted talk and i mean I, the list goes on but um yeah, I mean it's 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 a hard one because and I I've never um, spoken to him, but it seems like his his attitude. Um, you know, we we always hear about you know you you can only control what's within you. Your your attitude towards everything that happens to you in life. It seems like he's that, taken that to another level. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, he has an incredible mindset and 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 philosophy on life and. Uh, you know, I think I like when I was seventeen, eighteen. I think I read a, a, a report that said like, if you have a spinal injury accident, that like within a couple of years, your happiness level can be the same as anyone else. Like, and I genuinely believe that. Like that, he is incredibly happy and incredibly fulfilled, and he's, you know, he's so busy and he's so passionate about what he's doing, and. Um, like, look, you know, it kind of puts things in perspective. You, you, you have to play the, the cards you're dealt and you just have to keep going day to day. And obviously what everyone's going through now, it's the same thing. I mean, you can't, can't control the external things and you just have to just have to keep going. Um, and it's easier said than done, but uh, he's definitely been an inspiration in terms of 
I suppose for me in terms of what I do and the way I kind of look at you know life is short you may as well do something you enjoy something you're happy and and uh, once you can obviously pay the bills and that sort of stuff but um yeah no he's he's a great person like uh, he was a good tennis player as well he 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 played up till i think he was like 14 maybe he i mean he would have played fits he would have been top eight i'd say under under 12 and then kind of drifted away he started playing a little bit of rugby and stuff but uh, um but no he's 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 great yeah yeah i must check out that ted talk actually um yeah do yeah and we, we we mentioned Richard Branson. One of the questions I have here in front of me is, how in God's name did you end up in a situation where you're on Necker Island and Richard Branson is banging down your door at six in the morning to go swimming in the sea and playing tennis? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, a, not, je- yeah. not jealous at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, yeah, it's a re- it's a really again, it's a really funny one. Like, and I, I you know. Yeah, it, like so. In 2015, I played in Bashdad, which is an ATP 250, and I played with this guy Andy Silstrom, Swedish guy. He was about, he was like 70 in doubles, and we were out one night at dinner, and he was telling me about this event called the Necker Cup, um, Richard Branson tennis event, where he brings these, you know, it's the best tennis players in the world, like Nadal and Djokovic has been, and. Wozniacki and these kind of players and then business people come to the event and it's just this casual program so he told me about this and I was like geez it's uh that sounds that sounds amazing like um I think it was 2015 he told me but um the guy who founded the event was a guy uh or is a guy called Trevor Shore well the three founders Trevor Ram and, and Mike um and Trevor I basically reached out to Trevor uh and sent him a message on Facebook and was like, look, is there any way we can, I can have a call with you? Um, and like I always say to people, you know, you never know what's going to happen when you pick up the phone. Um, and basically what happened was I spoke to Trevor and there's there's obviously a couple of different elements to the Necker Cup, but the way I pitched it was I was like, look, I'm, I was I was actually stopping playing at, the, at that time as well. And I said... Like I'll stand on the court all day, so that when you know the, the 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 marquee pros are gone to the bar doing their thing, I was like, you'll never be short to player, um, and I'll hit with the business people or whatever. So I didn't. I mean, he could have just said no, obviously, but he came back and said, um, he said, yeah, you know, this is obviously in the early days of the event as well. So, um, but he said he he finally said, yeah, come. So I went out. Um, and obviously it's you know I mean the most incredible event um, in terms of tennis players and music and all that sort of stuff uh, and then I met Richard there very briefly and you know spoke to him <laughs> spoke to him very briefly like I was I didn't have like a you know I wasn't having dinner with him or something but I had a chat with him and then probably the more important person I met was the guy who runs the island just I, I suppose typical Irish thing at the bar one night I met him um, and then about a month later I got a I got an email from him um, from from the, the guy who runs the island saying would I come over and and coach him for a month and cover for the coach that's usually there so I've been lucky enough to do it do it a good few times and then obviously that's when I went then then I was one to one with Richard and, and, and got to know him got to know him uh, Got to know him well, so yeah. And what's uh, he like? He must be incredibly sharp and, and inspirational to be around, is he? Yeah, he's like he. Uh, you'd never hear me say a bad word. Like he is, he is. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, he's unbelievably hardworking in a in a good way. He's unbel- He absolutely loves tennis. Like mm-hmm. I've never, I've never met anyone who who's more obsessed with tennis than him. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, was I, have there. To, I have to say, for somebody who has his own court or courts. <laughs> uh, he's not the best tennis player in the world, is he? <laughs> this is not this is this is not going viral. This thing, is it? Uh, I hope no. Hope you don't. Um, no, like I mean, in, in his defence, he 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 started tennis when he was thirty years old, so his techniques are a little bit a little bit funky. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was he was obviously working so hard before then, but I mean, his like I did one stint with him where I was there 30 days and he played tennis 28 days twice a day um, and he might kite surf as well and and 
do stuff like that as well. Like he is unbelievably active and yeah, he does just, these crazy swims. You probably tell me one time. Yeah, he he said he said to me one day. Um, so he owns Necker, and then he owns Mosquito Island, which is which is um, beside beside close to Necker, um, which is another obviously incredible place. Uh, and he said to me one day, "Would I like to come over for for a lunch on Mosquito Island?" So I obviously said yes. And uh, and he said, "Well, he's like, do you do you swim well?" And I said, "I I'm, I wouldn't be that great." And he said, "Well, uh, I'm going to swim over. So if you want to join me on the swim, you can, or if you, you can take the boat if you like." So it's like a thirty minute swim. Jeez. So uh, I was in the boat anyway. Uh, but no, he's 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 um, no. I've I've been very lucky to to spend time with him and and uh, he yeah. Like I, just one more story. I remember like if I could describe him in one word, it would be kind of I'd say relentless is is a good word for him. Mm. You know, I remember he 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 was training for this. It's called the Virgin Strive event, um, and he was doing all these bike climbs on the other islands, um, and I thought. So he was went off to this climb, and I thought uh, he uh, played tennis with him that morning. He went for the bike ride, and then he was coming back. And I was like, "There's no chance he's playing tennis this evening." Like, um, and he came back, and he looked absolutely exhausted. But he's like, "Yeah, give me give me twenty minutes. I'll be down. I just have a like." He just he's so kind of obsessed, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's got that. So uh, yeah, I'm very you, lucky. You didn't, you didn't ever get the yips playing with him, did you? No, not like you and Tommy are either. Oh, that's <laughs> horrific. Yeah, that's, um, I love that story. Actually. Oh, stop. Um, so come here to me now. You are. Are you writing a book? That's a little rumor I heard. Who told you that? I can't. I keep, I keep my sources uh, quiet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like yeah, it's something I was. Um, I've been writing. I wasn't sure if it would be kind of short content that I would share on LinkedIn, or would I just turn it into into a book? But I've I've always wanted to write um, a book. Not that I'm like a, a great writer or anything, but uh, I always thought like the more I move away from from my tennis, the more distant the memories become, uh, and then also the you know obviously the time I spent on Necker and, and I've been lucky to continue to spend time there and the people, not just him, but the other really interesting people that I've met um, there and then also through tennis and, and the learnings that I've that I've got from them, I wanted to try and basically capture it. So um, obviously the coronavirus has helped and that yeah, I'm... Yeah, no better time. No better time that I can sit in my room and, and type away. So uh, yeah, watch this space. Yeah, cool. And I know I'm jumping around a bit here, but I, I, I sometimes ask, like to ask people if they, um, their, their very first intro to tennis um, or what, what made you fall in love with the sport when you were a little kid? Was it in, in the family or? Yeah, like my, my, my mom would be, my mom liked, likes tennis. Um, my brother and sister both played, so, so in Swords Tennis Club. Um, have you been to Swords? Ah, uh, once when I was a kid. Yeah, six six tarmac courts yeah. there, and and uh, they've turned them into Savannah now, actually. But uh, there was six six courts there, and uh, yeah, so I started in the parks actually. Um, like I used to play with my mom, um, and then I started in the parks. I think I was like five or six or whatever age you can start in the parks. Um, but the fu- the funny thing is, uh, I was actually really shy when I was a kid, and I always. Like I, I like I think I cried a lot. I think I had to be forced into going down initially, but then when I was playing, I loved it. Yeah. Uh, and it just kind of went from there, I suppose. You know, it, like that was my that was my intro, and then I suppose you kind of start to get the Leinster squads and all that stuff, and it just kind of snowballs from there. Yeah, I started in the parks as well, and it's a fantastic initiative. I didn't. Uh, oh, that's great. I, I remember when I was a little kid, I, I saw a few kids I knew from school walking towards St Anne's Park. And with their parents, I said to my mum, "Mum, something going on in the park." So we just wandered down, and I didn't even—I didn't even sign up or register. I just walked onto a court and joined the back of a queue without a racket, and just 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 joined in. Uh, so it was kind of funny. Story. Uh, that's great. Like, yeah. like I remember, like some of my earliest memories are 
I can remember, you know, you got that T-shirt, the Kit Kat T-shirt, and the man. Did you go to the mansion house? For I the- did. I won the biggest trophy I've ever seen. I won <laughs> it, and it was full, full of Kit Kats. It was. It was brilliant. <laughs> You were peaking at seven years old. Uh, do you know what I probably did? Um, <laughs> but no, I do remember that. Yeah. So, tell me, do you have a, a highlight from your plan, your professional career? Um, what's my what's my highlight? Uh, it's a good question. You kind of st- st- stumped me a little bit. Uh, there's a f- like, there's a few kind of. I think. I think. I remember going to watch Davis Cup when I was younger, like when I was a kid. I remember going to watch the ties in Riverview. I think, um, so that was always a huge ambition of mine to to um, to play Davis Cup, um, and yeah, that was that was one of my earliest memories that I wanted to play Davis Cup. And then I was lucky enough to to obviously be capped at nineteen and then play for I think it was nine years on the team, um, and then. Tennis wise, mem- memory wise, like uh, I won, I think I won two challengers, um, which are obviously highlights for me. Um, and then some of the wins I have as well, I suppose some of the matches uh, I played. Um, I had a, a good win against Goffan and Gabesh um, okay. which, which is, uh, which, I have good memories over, which was in a challenger, um, and then a loss as well. Like I, I, I actually shared it on my LinkedIn yesterday. Someone had sent it to me. Um, myself and Dave, Dave O'Hare played against Max Murney and, and Alexander Burry, um, and we lost. I think it was like seven six six seven seven five six seven uh, two six in the in the fifth, and. I said this to to Murney after because he uh, he was one of my heroes when I was when I was growing up playing, um, and I actually got his autograph when I was a kid as well, and I had it on my wall. So to actually go and then play him, to actually play him, and we had match point in the fourth set. Uh, I said I actually sent the video to Dave uh, yesterday or two days ago, and Dave was like, "I wish I hit the court with that return." So I think we. We had a, I can't even remember when the match point was. It was in the fourth set. Obviously, yeah. I, think, I think it was six five in the fourth, and and uh, it was it was like thirty forty or something. But um, I have great memories from that match. In some ways, like I just kind of yeah, that was that was that yeah, was Dave, good. Dave was talking yeah. about that yesterday. It sounds. What did he talk so, about it? In it yeah? He did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry for the crowd. I didn't even no, know. Yeah, that yeah. was. Yeah, are, you not, are you not are you not listening to these podcasts every night now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and then actually, sorry, the other the other really good memory is I won the Irish Open, which was a futures. Um, I won it with with Colin O'Brien in I think it was 2010. Um, so that was obviously very special to win that event. Like, yeah. um, and that's something that I, I think we lost, I lost in the final in 2011 then in the doubles, but. Um, yeah, that's obviously very special as well. Like, and I still have, you know, I still have those. I still have all those those trophies and stuff, and uh, they they'll come with me wherever I go. Like, yeah. And you, are you still playing now, or have you kind of hung the racket up? No, I still play. Yeah, like I, I definitely went through a phase when I first when I stopped playing that I was kind of I think actually I, I was forcing myself to play a little bit and I was coaching a lot as well so I kind of yeah. I was doing some errors at the time and I found it hard like I know some I know some coaches love to play and so I found it hard when I was on court coaching tennis to actually go and play um, so I like I still now I'm still actively involved in tennis I'm on the committee of the IC club for the international club I play a couple of those matches in the summer um, and probably not playing as much as I would have liked. Well, obviously I'm not playing anything at the moment, but um, I started playing a little bit of paddle tennis as well, which which I which I've enjoyed. But obviously tennis is my is my number one. Hmm. Yeah, good stuff. Um, I'm just gonna check the time. I know I have one friend of mine in particular texts me every day to say these are too long. So. Okay, no I, won't, I won't name and shame him. Um, but look, James, thanks a mil for coming on. And um, I will, if you want, I'll, I'll put a link to your uh, High Calibre Collective, um, etc. below the video.
do, yeah. And uh, so do I automatically go to number one in the, in the quiz, the um, leaderboard? I'll tell you what, I, I'm... There's a few podcasts I just want to do on my own, like book reviews and stuff. So what I'll do is I'll dial you in for uh, the quiz after I I do my own. Um, yeah, I can't believe I'm I'm last place in my own quiz. So it's a bit embarrassing. But, um, yeah. Was that a, was that alright for you there? That uh, we're, we're still recording, <laughs> folks. Oh, sorry. We'll wrap it up there, James. Thanks, Emil, and uh, we'll, we'll be back tomorrow.